Hi, my name is Suraj, and I'm a developer advocate at PyTorch. And my name is Justin, and I'm also a developer advocate at PyTorch. And today we are excited to be speaking with Rafiq and Christian from the Rafiq and Adol Studio. Welcome, guys. So good to have you here. Hello. Thank you very much. How are you? Hi, thank you. Thanks very much for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Well, uh, Rafiq, you, you and your team are award-winning computational artists. And what I find so fascinating about your work is that you use data, AI, and digital technologies to create something that is very uniquely human. Um, tell us a little more about your artistic background and maybe things that have influenced you to do what you do. Yes, happy. The first of all, so great to be here with Christian together with you because I think we as a studio on the shoulders of many wonderful things like, like your incredible uh, libraries, approach, research, all together. So we are grateful, first of all, for the community. I also read somewhere um, how you mentioned your art is about revealing that what is unseen. Yes. Um, and you, you have a series called Made as Pigments, which I thought was very interesting because uh, you, you look at data as memories, you look at them as pigments, but what they really hold are nuggets of information. Yes. And uh, you also said things like uh, buildings can dream and colors may be heard and sounds yes. can be seen. So yes. um, I'm interested to uh, learn, um, how, do, how do you use AI over here? Yes. So, I mean, Christian also with us here, I'm sure he will share amazing, uh, also his personal journey in the studio. But I will say, so first of all, the early days of data pigmentation, which I'm calling it, was very much obviously focusing on environmental data, which again, grateful for Kesarias and you know, incredible mentorship. 2012, I start plotting very early uh, wind data you know, through these open source sensors. Um, and then um, there was an amazing learning about like how to think about you know, um, information comes from a sensor about you know, sensing the nature. Right, the, the the weather data, humidity, temperature, wind gust, and direction. So that was a very early studies, and then later on, um, we with, with the AI, it it completely changed the imagination. And I want to go into 2016 because that project, to be honest, in my mind and in in our research, is one of the most uh, important one. Maybe we can quickly go at that one. First of all, the project is heavily inspired by this incredible book by. Um, Argentinian writer uh, mm -hmm. Borges and I was completely fascinated when I read this story way before what AI means but the idea of like one day hopefully <laughs> creating this library of the everything um, and it's a dream that one day every single data in the world is accessible to anyone in the world and um, so this was the story that I think inspired so in 2016 we start researching about the archives and thanks to Vasov Korten, uh, who is a well-known curator who challenged artists to like, you know, see beyond uh, what we can. And that's the idea of like, you know, turning the information into a knowledge in front of a library, in a live library where a human watches AI, <laughs> like reconstructing the sorting, the images and, you know, giving a meaning to these 1.7 million documents. So the obsession with, I think, archives started with this project. And I do believe that this has a very um, significant importance uh, in the AI arts. As far as I know, 2016, this is the one and only first piece uh, publicly available that allows you to, like, you know, interact with this 1.7 million documents at TSNE uh, data universe in real time or also in, in, in the VR as well. So not necessarily has to be a physical existential uh, thinking. But I will say this project triggered another idea called machine hallucinations, which was the idea of if a machine can learn, can it dream? I mean, any gamers, I'm pretty confident, like thinking about, or anyone loving science fiction like Philip K. Dick or William Gibson narratives. But to me, what was amazing on the left side, we are seeing a DC again um, result. Again, 2016 is a very early days for, you know, after Ian Goodfellow's incredible, you know, unveiling the idea. To me, this was the moment that the, the another like research started. Like, how can we take this, what AI can learn from, in this case, 1.7 million documents, but how can we turn this into like a data pigmentation? So we start like using fluid dynamics specifically on top of these machine decisions or the latent walks. 
And last, I will say, six years we train, and again, Christian can explain more, but we have more than 3 billion images and, and train more than 100 AI models. And again, thanks to NVIDIA friends that I think also joined the support process. Um, we were able to like work with uh, PGGAN, StyleGAN, 2ADA, 3, uh, of course, recent studies with DALI2 and OpenAI and wonderful research. But what I want to say is in this research, we learned that from the culture, nature, space, urban, and we look at idea and the archive of the humanities collective memories. Like, as you may see, it's all about like seeing this new world and happy to say that this research unfold into a whole new body of work. Uh, and last six years, um, as you may see here, we explore all these outcomes in a very different and try to be um, characteristically unique um, to look at these patterns of how machine, you know, can represent these dreams. Hmm. So when you when you use data as your raw material, I think it really helps to use AI models which can uh, grok grok them at scale. I I I actually want to uh, talk to you about the machine hallucinations uh, piece as well because it almost seems very synesthetic in mm -hmm. its nature, mm -hmm. like you're taking. You're taking information in one domain and you're using models to represent them uh, for humans to experience them in a completely different way. Um, what, what emotions or what responses are you trying to invoke with such arts, uh, such pieces of art? I, I think the, the, the main narrative I'm seeing extremely... Ex so first of all, I think like Monet, right? If you look at the history of art, it's always like happened, right? In many different you know, centuries and decades. But if you look at Monet as a, like an example, like how he inspired from the atmosphere, right? And how he was depicting like the, you know, the, the unseen atmospheric world or the landscapes. I don't believe it's so different to think that in this case, like we have a thinking brush. And I think this brush truly, we can dip into the mind of a machine, this artificial mind of a machine and really paint with that, you know, thinking brush. And as you can see here, even though they look maybe similar algorithms, as you may feel that the outcome is extremely different. And I think like this question of how, you know, machines could simulate unconscious and, you know, subconscious events, right? Such as dreaming, like remembering and hallucinating, that became like a fundamental feeling. Um, and I do believe that these pieces are kind of creating that in different contexts. Um, and of course, let's also remember that we are just watching a two dimensional representation. What gets much inspiring to me is when we take this research and bring it into architectural domain. And that's, I think, where we start to see what happens if architecture goes beyond concrete, steel, or glass. What happens if the, like, the walls, which has barely you know, innovative function, than just you know, Newtonian or, like, or, or like some you know, fundamental like, physical reality of a building, how can we go beyond that what we see? is I think when we connect the art, architecture and neuroscience, art, AI and technology, like when they all combine, I feel like that's where the um, serendipity happens. It, it almost sounds like you're perhaps using AI to anthropomorphize what are non-living objects really. It's a perfect moment because I feel like I, I love this so much what you mentioned because I think what we do is finding human in non-human. Christian, I'm pretty sure you want to like talk about like our process um, because it's really also inspiring to me like how we start and how we like, you know, go through amazing algorithms um, if you want, Christian. Yeah, definitely. Well, hi, by the way, um, my name is Christian. I'm a lead data scientist at Rafik and Adol Studio. Um, I've been working with Rafik now, I think since 2017 or 2018. Uh, kind of right when all of the machine hallucinations research kicked off. I actually began as a data aggregator. You know, I can say very, very proudly that we put together some great pipelines and since 2017 have downloaded nearly 3 billion images. Um, you know, it's an amazing process to work with all of these images, right? Because we go and we think about doing a project, like I'm pretty sure New York City was the first project I worked on. Yes, and when awesome. we go and we, and we collect these images from public resources, you know, the the intention isn't to do anything crazy, right? But it's rather collect all of the collective memories from all of the people who have gone and experienced New York. I think it's kind of why it feels so relatable to people, even when, you know, they're all computer generated images, you know, what we're really seeing are 
the visions of the collective memories of everyone who's ever been in New York and taken a picture. I, I think, think it's very, very powerful. So Christian, this is an amazing example because for us, this Art Tech House installation in New York, I think 2018 as a research and 19 as an output, I felt like it was a very rewarding um, experiment because I, we are calling it experiments, by the way. I don't think these pieces are like finished or say like, that's it because, you know, the data is alive and it is alive and um, there is no way to like say this frozen reality of a model represents, you know, <laughs> anything but just an experiment. So what was it really inspiring to us is like, as you remember, like this last, you know, seven, six years of like data pigmentation or fluid dynamic research on the neural networks, um, became here physically visible. Like what we felt in this exhibition, by the way, people staying four or five hours meditating, like uh, representing some beautiful responses. Absolutely. I mean, what's been really exciting for me personally to work on with all of these projects is like, how do you take some complex abstract, uh, you know, mathematical or machine learning models and apply them to things that are realistic and that people, you know, feel and understand and then show the results of these amazing, amazing technological advancements we have to people in like a communicable and understandable way. It's really, really interesting. And by yeah. the way, we are also, when there's a, I think this, what I would like to say is presenting the technology in a way that not only just, you know, its own context, but for example, this piece, I believe is a emotionally important, right? We have around 75 million flower photos and um, from the Smithsonian archives of 16,000 species ever so far, apparently um, defined. In this um, model, like, yes, we had a beautiful, you know, um, visual representation of an AI can, you know, could reconstruct any flowers. But also we thought that what will happen with the sound of the forest, right? There's a lot of incredible open source and nature um, audio archives. And what will happen if we can also the sense of the scent of this AI? And for example, for this one, we even created this special scent engine uh, in collaboration with Ferminich. And we were able to let uh, their AI called Charlie train on half million scent molecules and dream <laughs> a scent called Rainforest and even project on this room. Oh, wow. Wow, this That's is such a multi-sensory experience, right? Yeah. Exactly. And I do believe that, um, so, so, so this specific research, like we start in the studio, outreach and amazing scientific research, but at the end land in a free public art where any generation, any culture background can open this door and feel this, um, you know, unique, unique experience uh, where AI construct the sound and the image and the scent as well. Um, so to me, this is an exciting journey, how we can push the boundaries. So as, as part of your, your artistic process, do you let the art just sort of unfold, like based upon just the way how the models and data is trained? Or like, is there some sort of like, oh, I'd like it to take shape in this type of way? Is there some way <laughs> to, to nudge it and influence it in that manner? So Christian, I think it's a great time to maybe explore, like, for example, so this, this data universes, we are showing a lot and very, very enjoying. Uh, Mozart, Rumi, uh, Zahadit, like a MoMA archive, like it's really, you know, any image, sound and text archive, Renaissance, right? The, you know, the older writings and images and sorry, paintings and the sculptures. So we always like start with this context, but then find these new forms of meaning. Like mm -hmm. there is no single way for any human, I guess, like to remember like millions of images, <laughs> but you know, they just somehow represented in our mind, right? Mm -hmm. So this UMAP or lower dimension reduction pipelines to me is one of the most amazing sculpting process. Maybe Christian, you can mention the, the tools we are using, please. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, so from like a, from a technical side of things, you know, one thing that I think that we've found a lot of success in doing is actually, you know, mostly unsupervised learning. Yes. Right? It's, it's a lot of, I feel like anytime we take on a project and anytime we start researching a new subject, what it really is to me more than anything else is data exploration, right? You know, of course we collect the images, but it's way more about what we can learn from the data rather than we can extract from the data. You know, of course there's like, curating here and there, you know, if we have way too many pictures of one subject and it leads to an overfit model, um, you know, we need to slim down the certain numbers to get good models, of course, things like that. 
right? But definitely, you know, when we start talking about collecting, um, you know, the collective memories of a location or a species of flower or anything like that, again, you know, it really is much more about what we can learn from the data rather than we tell the data. Um, and that's that's a really inspiring thing. So cool. much more exploration than anything actually, else. Actually, it's a great uh, world because Unsupervised is our uh, uh, next name of the exhibition at MoMA. Uh, specifically, we learned that uh, this word has a much positive resonance in in understanding the machine process. Um, and And I think it's really interesting to think that even though like there are so many cutting edge algorithms maybe can do incredible like image recognition and, and so on, but still giving a chance of a machine to co-create is so fun than try to find the absolute truth in any like, you know, archive. And, and I think that, that letting, letting go of creativity and lowering the barrier of like egocentric thinking versus like how machine can become an extension of mind is more inspiring than, you know, stuck in just, you know, certain uh, truth of an algorithm. Versus like, you know, even for like GAN trainings, right? Like we are intentionally sometimes, you know, extremely experimenting with these learning rates and try to be more abstract, like not necessarily try to mimic the reality. But again, it all starts with the data, as Christian mm -hmm. mentioned. At the end, the ground truth, which is the memory, <laughs> is, is like where, you know, the input for yeah, that. It's, I, actually, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's actually really funny because for the unsupervised project specifically, we had a great set of classifiers for this MoMA data. And we spent quite a bit of time actually training supervised models and supervised dimension reduction plottings, and then threw all of it away. We were just like, no, <laughs> <laughs> none of that. Only on supervised learning here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. Earlier you mentioned that, you know, you refer to these uh, as experiments and that they're constantly evolving. And yeah, if you're doing unsupervised learning and you're sort of letting that art you know, take shape and form based upon that data. It, it's kind of interesting to think that like, there might be like unique, like, oh, if, uh, moments of time where the art is, is different. So it's like, you're there, you're looking at it, you're viewing it, you're watching it in front of you. And then a half an hour later, somebody comes and looks at it and it's a different path because the data. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, one thing that really, in our, you know, dialogues with the curators and, you know, art, art enthusiasts, we always do something very important, I think is, is, is fundamental for us, is we always unveil the name of the algorithm, where data comes from, researchers behind the algorithm. We have this super clear, uh, sharp approach in any exhibition. We have always a monitor, a dedicated space, where we demystify and unveil the behind the scenes. While we got critics, oh, now I learn everything about this. And, but it's not about like hiding the process at all. It's about actually, because I think the AI specifically in this age, in this specific mission intelligence age is incredibly important to like unfold as much as, um, while there's a significant, you know, fears and, you know, um, potential ramification predictions, but we really want to like take this idea of like, what else can we do with that? And how can we explain this in a way without looking from top, but, you know, just as, as simple and honest and open as possible. Um, and I think this is a, this is one of the most exciting way of sharing. Yeah. Since uh, since so much of your work is very multimodal in nature, you mentioned image or uh, text. Um, this must be a really exciting time, right? Like yes. with all of the models coming out. Yes. Um, uh, the the really good stuff coming out. Um, yes. But there is also a criticism that is being yes. leveled against these models. Um, uh, you know, that they are basically harming traditional artists or eating into that space. Uh, Rafiq, you have used Make a Scene, uh, which is a model that you, um, you give it a text prompt and you give it a very rough sketch and it sort of interpolates that into a very nice uh, illustration. Uh, as an artist, what is your opinion about these technologies? So first of all, I'm extremely uh, positive. First of all, I can't draw. Like I can't even like know how to draw. So I'm in the, like this bias side of like if I can't draw, like can a machine help to draw better and like imagine this world? So I, I feel like this co-creation is extremely exciting. I don't see that problem that some friends are seeing, but I also understand them very well because sometimes people from not from the field who have been like you know physically producing and and you know generating a lot of um, you know amount of work and when someone you know suddenly sees uh spending a couple of seconds and producing i, I can understand that feeling definitely 
But also I feel like it's an extension of mind. It's a completely a new ways of imagining. Um, so I'm pretty sure that should be a, like a balance between, you know, how to ethically source and generate these models and how to really make them available for public. And I mean, we saw many great examples in the Discord channels to so like, you know, GitHubs and so on. Um, so we love it. I mean, with Zahadid Architects, for example, with Patrick Schumacher, we explore many uh, multi-models together and 3D model outcomes. But I saw the joy in the face of an architect. I mean, they felt like, wow, this is like producing and promising and offering us a world that is not so hard to imagine. So so, so this moment, or, or like the, you know, a Rumi, right? Persian poet that there's no way to, we can imagine like things about, or the mods. Like we tried so many different ways of imagining these things that we cannot uh, otherwise. So to me, it's a serendipity. It's, it's almost like uh, you gain an additional skill where you're taking the latent representation exactly. between your years and you're able to bring that out in a very tangible way that other people can also um, communicate with. Absolutely. Since art is very open to interpretation and it's quite subjective uh, by, by definition, do you think when you, when you start using AI and other digital technologies to uh, to create art, do you think there's a time where uh, it'll start to become more individualized? Like, for example, um, let's say I just wear an EEG headset, mm -hmm. and based on what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling, the the art installation changes, and it uh, becomes just bespoke for me. Mm -hmm. So this is an amazing, I think, situation. I I love this idea so much because, first of all, unfortunately, uh, our journey with um, brain started 2017 with an unfortunate event that um, I learned that my uncle was unfortunately diagnosed by Alzheimer's. Um, by the way, I'll be going next week to meet with him. After five years, he's diagnosed and I'm you know, researching with him one-on-one -on -one and his brain signals. That's where I started this project called Melting Memories. And what was really incredible is, thanks to, by the way, Professor Adam Gesley from UCSF, he trained me and entire our team like how to use this cap and how to use 800 plus EEG research data. And we use, we use EEG learn uh, algorithm back in time to like classify the moment of remembering. So to me, this was like a, one of the first experiment, at least in our research, we found that it's still AI can be this intermediary like, you know, process where our most important data, I do believe memories, can still be, you know, sub, you know, encrypted into this art context, and and this was a very exciting exhibition that we found that people completely enjoy um, this idea of like transcoding the data from the you know surface level, which is a sometimes very noisy data, still turn into like a noise algorithm and reconstruct it. So this was the first time we saw a beautiful reaction uh, from the audience around the world. Uh, but now it's very predictable that multi-model process, of course, understanding latent space with like brain signals is an absolute joy and a speculation still. <laughs> yeah, I think this is this is interesting because, you know, part of, uh, you know, the subjectivity of art is also to like share your experience with others and to, to, to share that. So if like if multiple people are wearing uh, those headsets like and, and seeing what they're how that is reacting like. You know, being able to share and be like, this is what I see versus like, what do you see? And kind of seeing like what that is based upon that moment in time and, and the, the, the interaction that you're having with that art, I think is pretty interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, you know, like how and why did you choose uh, uh, to move all your work to, to PyTorch? Aha, uh -huh, Christian, please. Uh <laughs> By the way, we have a couple of our friends who are not here in the studio, but I'm sure Christian will represent this answer very well. Absolutely. Well, one of the biggest improvements for us, I think, I think Rafiq touched on it a little bit when he said accessibility. You know, the, really the biggest thing for us is accessibility and, and ease of use. Um, you know, PyTorch has really allowed us to speed up our development for a number of reasons. I guess the first, the first one that comes to my mind would be uh, Torch Hub. 
Torch Hub is a great place for all of us to be on the same page with the latest models. You know, it's really easy to just swap out. You know, we have one piece of code where you just pass in a command line flag for like image embeddings, for example. And you know, it will just change the it will change the model we use. We have access to so many models. You don't have to go online, download the weights, compile any tools, anything like that. So Torch Torch is really uh, PyTorch has really streamlined a lot of our processes and made everybody like make all the models super accessible to people. It's really, really just a huge improvement. One tool that we worked on recently, so I had been using uh, YOLO v4 as like a compiled C tool for a very, very long time on like a couple machines. And um, in the last six months or so, we actually converted to YOLO v5 on uh, PyTorch. And you know now everyone on our team can use the tools. You can clone the Git repo. You can download it. You can run it on your machine. You know what the environment's going to look like, and it's absolutely fantastic because now we can take this, you know, previously compiled tool that was compiled specifically for machines. We can go clone the repo, put on on any machine, and run it anywhere we want, and it works exactly as expected. So accessibility is the number one thing that comes to my mind, and then you know also just overall developer experience as well. You know, PyTorch has been fantastic. You know, I, you know, I remember when we first started doing this, um, how much time and effort. You know, very honestly, we spent troubleshooting a lot of TensorFlow stuff, a lot of, a lot of time there. Um, you know, PyTorch really focuses on that developer experience and makes the ease of use really accessible to everyone. It's always very obvious, well documented, so it's just fantastic. And one more also amazing thing, as Christian mentioned, our entire GAN pipelines latent space browser. And uh, we completely like ported back like, you know, and, and I think the speed, the efficiency, as, as Christian mentioned, like compiling between machines, which we always exhibit around the world. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's just, everything became so smooth than before. Yep. For scalability and accessibility, I mean, it really improved our quality of life at the studio so, so much, especially yeah. as we grew and, you know, data science team got bigger, made a huge difference. Yeah. And that's why, one more time, very much deep thankful and grateful for the, everyone uh, who is supporting this incredible journey uh, with or without knowing. So we are very grateful for everyone <laughs> at PyTorch. Yes, all the, all the thousands and thousands of contributors to the PyTorch repo. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, promise to make great art for humanity. <laughs> <laughs> promise. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, it's it's fascinating to to hear just how much data you're you're taking in, and you know, not just like just images. It's it's all different types, and and creating that machine to to take in the the sounds. Um, you know, one thing uh, I had a friend who always would say like, "Oh, I'd like to know what things smell like." Like looking at a picture and knowing like what you know, what does this nature scene smell like? And so it's like, have you ever done any experimentation with with that? And like, yeah, what are what are your plans for yes. combining things in the future? <laughs> so the answer is our upcoming uh, fun but a challenging project called Data Land. It's our take on metaverse, where we think that exactly this type of ideas, where the physical and virtual connects with AI and data for any age, any background, open and culturally you know, uh, borderless. Um, so we are hoping to make these experiments for public uh, in our space, opening in Los Angeles, hopefully next year, and then inviting you know, researchers uh, all around the world to find that type of um, unique experiences with AI and data. Cool. Um, yes, Raj, did you have any other further questions? Yeah, I, I heard a little something about uh, something happening at MoMA. Yeah, so very happy to say that our show is opening 18th of November at MoMA. And this is a very important for, I hope, the entire AI community because it's the very first time we will be witnessing a machine learning algorithm in real time, which I, we are calling it living painting. We'll be getting a real time data from the microphone, which is not recording, a camera not recording, and a climate data of the museum. We'll be infusing in real time an algorithm train on the entire MoMA archive. And this archive is so unique because I think this archive has pretty much every single pioneer in the arts um, for you know, 220,000 options <laughs> and incredible like heroes of humanities, arts. Um, so it's a kind of a homage to like, you know, I think a checkpoint in the art history to remind us uh, them and our future. So it will be open and public and free and hope to be there giving workshops together, sharing behind the scenes, educational context, 
And it's free and open to everyone. It's a public art at MoMA, Agnes Gand Lobby. And thanks to Michelle Kua and Paolo Antonelli, curators, uh, to let us uh, generate this amazing work of art. Cool. Yeah, when, you, when you say it's a, it, it's a workshop, like, you know, do people have, like, hands-on experience with learning how to, to create art with AI? Or yeah. is it, like, interacting and, and, and yeah. Yes, hope to hope to create as much as educational context we can in this four or five months of um, uh, open exhibition time. Yeah, that's that's really cool. It's a really interesting and great opportunity. Like if you're interested in in AI art and learn want to learn how to get started, I think that's a cool opportunity. Um, one of the things that just an observation that, that I think is really fascinating about this is when I think back, it's like you know, and and we talked about like you know, can art become too perfect and um, you know, I think that like AI art is another like medium of art, right? Instead of using, you know, a, a palette and a paintbrush and, you know, representing shapes and images or abstract ideas on a, on a physical canvas, you're, you're taking a bunch of different things. You're taking, you're not just limited by paint and pigment. Like you're, you're able to create your paints, your pigments through whatever you can in that digital realm. So whether it's, uh, you know, smell data, sound data, uh, climate data, uh, image assets, you know, you name it, you can, if you take it, you can put it together and, and train it. And yeah, you can do lots of different things. And so, you know, I, I think from just our conversation and it's really interesting to see like this whole new art form sort of take shape. Thank you very much. Very grateful to be in the journey all together with the team and everyone. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rafiq and Christian, uh, for joining us today. That was such a fascinating conversation. I cannot wait to go and participate at the MoMA exhibit. Um, if I may say so, I think that's a very pioneering homage to the pioneers. And I'd love to experience that in person. And uh, who was watching this, uh, if, if you can, you should definitely Oh, make it. That sounds pretty incredible. Yes. When was that again? When, when is 18th, the event? 18th of November, opening public. All right. 18th free of November. And, yeah, free and open to everyone. And uh, you said it's uh, it starts. So uh, how long will the event last? Uh, at least four to four months at the moment. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great. Thanks so much.